Well, hey everybody, uh, welcome to the weekly wine blog with Wes Hagen. I'm the vineyard manager and winemaker here at Clopepe Vineyards and Clopepe Estate Wines in the Santa Rita Hills, which is between Lompoc and Buellton, northern Santa Barbara County, California, United States. It is the 24th of June and it is 2014. Uh, a couple things going on in the vineyard that I should mention. Number one, we found our first pink berry. So Verasion has uh, begun. Uh, that process of the berries softening and turning color represents the moment that the seed is viable and the moment that it is a palatable to an animal. So as the uh, grape changes color, that means that the uh, birds are going to start paying attention to those. And within a few weeks, we can expect to see our first starlings and our little flitty birds and the house finches and stuff looking for fruit. So uh, we're going to try to get out in the vineyard as quickly as we can, finish our cultural practices, pull a few more leaves, and then basically uh, start throwing nets over. After the nets over, we'll start going through uh, at about 80 to 90 percent uh, verasion when 80 to 90 percent of the fruit has changed color. We'll take the, uh, the fruit that's not changing color, the stuff that's lagging behind that's still green, and we'll drop that on the ground, 10 or 15 percent of the fruit. So we'll start with about 3 to 3.3 tons per acre and we'll end up right at about 2.8 to 3.1 tons per acre on Pinot Noirs. Our target yield, about 22 to 25 clusters per uh, plant. So that's sort of what's going on in the field. But today I wanted to talk about a very uh, sort of um, overarching subject, a subject that's both simple but one that we don't really talk about too much in wine. I keep asking myself, what are the things that are like fundamentally known to a winemaker that wouldn't be known to people who love wine that can give you guys a better understanding of what you're drinking? And so the question I came up with this time is just about as fundamental as it gets. Where does wine flavor come from? Why does wine taste like it does? And what relationship does it have with the natural sort of uh, biology of the grape? So I love this picture of a grape. This is actually a fantastic book that... Uh, I, I've been reading Clark Smith's uh, Postmodern Winemaking. If you haven't read it and you're a geek, you should pick it up and, and check it out because it's not only uh, super technical, but it's also very passionate. And if you think you know Clark Smith, I think you need to read this book because it really surprised me just how sort of um, poetic and how passionate his descriptions of wine are. Uh, Clark sometimes gets a reputation of being overly geeky and I think this book is actually fantastic and will show you a different side of Clark than you ever knew. So if you haven't picked up this book, check it out. But I, I wanted to show this beautiful grape so when I show you a little bit of other stuff uh, you can kind of understand what's going on. So we're going to be talking about uh, the grape skin and then we're going to be talking about sort of what's inside the grape. So here is the overview. The overview is basically me going to be telling you where certain things come from within the grapes. So the first thing we have to kind of imagine is the grape broken down into three major places. Sort of the skin, sort of outside the skin towards the uh, seed, which we're going to call the middle berry. And then we're going to talk about right near the seed, the very interior of the grape. And I had no idea about this. As I well, went through in my studies this morning to get ready to teach all you fine folks a little bit about wine, I actually learned something. Um, that near the seed is where the malic acid in the wine comes from. And the malic acid is a bright, appley acid uh, that kind of, uh, in white wine, you would attribute to like a Sauvignon Blanc, that nice, bright, appley acid that you get in a Sauvignon Blanc that is not run through malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation turns malic acid into lactic acid. As you will notice, there is no lactic acid naturally in a grape. So near the seed, you have uh, malic acid and sugar. Now, as you move away from the seed into the interior and the middle of the pulp of the grape, which is called the pericarp, um, or basically the middle of the grape, um, you get tartaric acid and sugar. So you get in this pulp, near the seed, you got the malic acid. A little further out, you've got the tartaric acid. And the tartaric acid is acid that's going to stay in the, in the grapes, in the wine, that's going to give the wine its structure. Tartaric acid is what we use to add acid to wine during fermentation if the wine needs a little bit more acid. So tartaric acid is very expensive acid because really the only place you can buy tartaric acid is tartaric acid that comes in a bag that has been basically scraped from tanks after they've been made into wine. So tartaric acid comes from grapes. There's only two sources of tartaric acid in the world. Wine grapes or grapes and hawthorn fruit. And so if you find tartaric acid on something archaeologically, you're talking about something that has touched wine or has touched hawthorn fruit. So it's important to the archaeology of wine too. But more important and the most important thing to understand, so you've got organic acids and you've got sugar in that nice little pulpy, wet part of the grape. 
But where does the flavor come from? The flavor really comes from the peripheral area that's also uh, right around the skin. It's all these vascular bundles and all of these amazing vacuoles that are filled. These vacuoles and these, uh, uh, and these vascular bundles are all absolutely filled with phenolic and polyphenolic compounds. And those phenolic and polyphenolic compounds really drive the flavor. So in a white wine, you're going to basically squeeze the juice right out of the grapes into a fermentation vessel. So you take freshly squeezed juice and you're going to be turning that into wine. So what happens is when you press the grapes, the vascular bundles and the vacuoles are, are basically shattered and then whatever was in them leaks into the juice. But you only get what leaks into the juice in that very small amount of time where the grapes are being pressed. So you get some of the phenolics, some of the polyphenolics, a little bit of the skin character, but that's why white wine is crisp and bright and light, because you don't have all of the maceration that you would get in the red. What am I talking about with maceration? Red wine. So when you make red wine, you basically crush the grapes and you leave the grape skins in contact with the juice, sometimes up to a month usually between 10 and 14 days. And then you mix the grapes and the juice and the juice and the grapes and you continue to mix that up because as the grapes ferment, they produce uh, uh, carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is gonna lift the skins to the top Then you gotta push the skins that have the gas back into the wine three, four times a day just to keep that mixing. Now that maceration process allows ethanol as it's produced to begin melting the mesocarp to melt the vascular bundles, to melt the vacuoles, to get all of the flavor out of those little areas into the wine. So every day in the fermenter, the wine gets darker and darker and darker because those um, those chemicals, those uh, everything from est you know everything from chemical esters to uh, you know salts to all the different things that make wine taste like wine go into the wine during the maceration of the berry. So uh, I'm going to hold this up just for a sec to show you the different parts of the grape. You can see the skin has been peeled away from this grape, so you can see sort of all of that stuff. Now really, a lot of the vascular bundles are within the skin as it's peeled back, but in this outer area, this peripheral area, you are going to see a lot of those, um, uh, a lot of those chemicals that I was describing. So most of the flavor is coming from within here and actually within the actual skin of the grape. The medium area that has the tartaric acid is right here, and the middle area right here is where you get the malic acid. So when you squeeze the grape, in white wine, all the juice and all the different acids are just going to come out in the juice, but in a red wine, all the flavor from the skin and the peripheral area are going to be leaking into the fermentation as it occurs. Now, why would wine taste delicious to a human being, why are these flavors in wine delicious? Two reasons. Number one is we have genetically modified the grape from one original grape, as if, if you remember one of my older talks, all grapes are genetic modifications of one single grape that emerged from Transcaucasia about 9,000 years ago. Now, as they moved all around the world, there's two things to consider. One, human beings allowed grapes to mutate randomly and chose the random mutations that made delicious wine. So human beings are really to blame uh, for all the little difference and deliciousness between you know, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, between Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo. All those grapes come from the same genetic mother-father, but the way that we've allowed them to genetically mutate makes all the difference. And then, of course, we started with a grape that develop, developed and evolved to do one thing, and that's to feed birds and other animals that eat the fruit and spread the seed around the forest. So it's very important to realize that we started with a base product that was delicious, and it was delicious because the grapes wanted to fool animals into eating their, uh, the delicious fruit and spreading it, or to allow that fruit to kind of rot and ferment on the vine, and then it would lead the animals to the uh, deliciousness by virtue of intoxication. So grapes fermenting on the vine had to be delicious to attract animals, and then humans, as they allowed those grapes to adapt and mutate, have allowed different phenolic compounds and all of those things to develop, so wine is delicious depending on wherever it happens. That's about it. That's where the flavor in wine comes from. Um, hope you learned something about the physiology of the grape and how that all works. Hope you guys have a great week. I'm going to take a week off next uh, week. I'll be up in, uh, in uh, Monterey at a literature conference, so you'll probably won't do a, a video tomorrow or, or next week, or maybe I will. Who knows? Um, but I hope you learned something today. Pass this along to your friends, and we'll talk to you soon.